Sometimes for these reviews, I just open up the windows and let in a bunch of natural light, which I'm where kind of does the two face thing to me. Sorry about that. I hope it's not distracting. I just like having sunshine on my skin. The Grace of Kings, the first book in the Dandelion Dynasty by author Kin Liu is a hell of a book to talk about here today. And one that I actually read a couple of years back, got too busy and just wasn't able to get around to reviewing. And so I then just fully reread it here today. And for anyone who has read Grace of Kings, you'll probably understand when I say, I'm really glad that happened. Not only is it a delightful book that's a joy to read from beginning to end, but it is girthy enough in scope that reading it twice before reviewing it is just beneficial. I also, in my brain, was starting to meld what happened in the second book, in the third book with the first book, and I just really wanted to avoid ever accidentally spoiling something here, so it was the right call for me to just fully go through this again, and it really does hold up on a second read. I genuinely loved going through this again, and let's talk about why this book seems to make such an impact with such a high percentage of the people who read it. The story of Grace of Kings covers a war, its aftermath, and then another conflict. No, I'm not talking about the full series of the Dandelion Dynasty, I'm talking about Grace of Kings. This is one of the broadest narratives in terms of how much it's trying to condense down into, yeah, a big book, but not a gargantuan one I've come across in a long time. And it pulls it off masterfully, which makes this being a debut book all the more impressive. I want to just say something here. I don't normally respond to comments, but this one, I just need to know that people are aware of this. I said to a debut book that it was a very impressive debut book that an author had then released a bunch of books afterward for, and I got a comment that was like, it's not that impressive. The guy's written a bunch of books since then. You all know they don't go back and like revive, it's still a debut book. Like I, That doesn't change when they release more, what? Anyway, the structure of the story of Grace of Kings is very, we are hopping to key moments of these conflicts. We are following the major players, two of them really at the core here, which would be Kunigaru, and I'm gonna really try my best here. Mata Zindu. And in the most general sense, you could say Grace of Kings is the story of their relationship, which is going to draw in a whole lot of people immediately, because I know there's so many people who love a good fantasy book that kind of revolves around a friendship or a just dynamic between two very important, uh, very influential individuals. But I think it's fair to say that the narrative does have one central character between the duo, and that would be Kunigaru. But there's something about the way this book is written that makes you, the reader, not necessarily feel like a fly on the wall just following a character throughout their journey like so many other books do. I think a lot of authors really strive to make the reader feel like they are just a witness to events of someone's life. Instead, Grace of Kings, you kind of feel more like one of the gods that's actually playing into the narrative as well. You are bearing this like ultimate witness to all of these key moments through a massive cast of characters, but even if you're following for a moment a tertiary character for a small self-contained story that's taking place within Grace of Kings, you know there's going to be a tumbling effect of how these events are going to then uh, impact one of our main two. It's all connected. And what I really love about that for Grace of Kings is it allows the story to kind of have just a bunch of self-contained narratives with their own themes and observations that do play into the wider story and the wider ideas going on. Well, it simultaneously comes across like you're recounting some grand historical text or narrative. Ken Liu has this ability to transport you, the reader, and make you simultaneously feel like you're reading another Lord of the Rings, but also just witnessing important history. And maybe the most impressive aspect for me personally for Grace of Kings is how big the scope is, how much ground is being covered, yet how much intimate character development is still delivered. Kunigaru especially we watch from being just kind of a roguish scallywag into becoming this historic 
figure, which is something we've encountered a few times here recently on the channel, especially with our recent obsession with Sun Eater. I say our, my. And I would say if a problem did emerge for me on this reread of the book, at the beginning, the writing is a little bit clunky as it's trying to find its footing. I think once it does find its footing, everything is elevated. Maybe it was just my brain kind of adjusting to the storytelling style. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. But also, at times in the former half of the book, it feels like Kunigaru just cannot fail a charisma check, almost to the point of it being a little OP. There are people who he charms where, if I'm being fair, it just feels like that person might be extraordinarily stupid to have fallen for him. But with how we know there are certain forces influencing events and with how much Kunigaru kind of proves himself throughout the story of Grace of Kings, yeah, it can be jarring, but I also could easily make the case that it's earned. And as he begins to ascend, and as the history momentum begins to kind of fold into the momentum of everything that's happening in the story, it feels like you need a character who's on that level because of how uh, insane of a conflict they're getting into. And I'm not talking about just the war front. There are gods at play, very, uh, I honestly can't really speak to how gods in China, which is what this story is uh, based off of, are presented. But for me, as someone who was educated in America, the way the gods are presented felt very Mount Olympus. They are human, they are involved, and they, they tweak, they push, they do those things. And I really love when a mythology, when a magic system is implemented that way. And with Dandelion Dynasty's focus on philosophy and literally pulling from real world philosophical texts, I mean, there's a thing at the end of the book even talking about how one poem that was saying these things is woven in and I think it's done incredibly well. On reread I was really looking to see if things felt heavy-handed at times and specifically with observations on love and tragedy there is certainly a formula that I feel uh, Kin Liu is falling back on to an extent. You could argue though that in wartime Love is a vulnerability, and so yeah, there's often going to be attempts to strike at it. Again, towards the latter half of the book, there are some subversions to that pattern that emerges earlier on, and so, well, at a time, you could be like, wow, this is happening a lot, and it feels similar. It then goes on a left turn, and you kind of have this like, all right, wah, momentum to what you thought you'd be able to predict. I'm trying to keep it spoiler free and I really hope I'm doing a good job. It's almost magical how effectively this book is able to, again, as I said, jump from event to event. I mean, you're not following, you know, typical insert protagonist as he's marching across the land. You jump from important events in their lives to important events in their lives, yet there is a clarity to relationship development, to character development that is accomplished extremely subtly, especially after we get through the first conflict and enter the second, we can tell how much our characters have changed and evolved. And I don't believe there's a ton of time devoted to describing how they've changed physically, but you get an impression of, you know, the, the worn down internal part of themselves due to the extreme events they may have won or been victorious through, but still have an impact on them because duh. And age is understood subtly, nuanced in a way that affects these characters as they go down different paths. And I really appreciate how power, I mean, oh my God, you could make an entire video. I think someone should, a video essay on observations on the corruption of power on the individual because no one, including Kunigaru, is innocent of it. The more you ascend, the more you are treated as other, it's going to warp your brain. It's going to make you make decisions, whether you're still on the right side of history or not, that you wouldn't have made before. If you came up from the bottom, if you were just walking the streets one day, you would absolutely never imagine yourself being able to make a call that would result in tens of thousands of people dying. But if you are becoming powerful, you are forced into those situations. And as you make them again and again, and again, it's going to chip away at a part of you. You can still stay devoted to your cause. You can still try and be a good leader, but that's where Grace of Kings, especially as it kind of gets into its uh, closing chapters, really starts focusing on legacy. What is legacy? What is, is it ever fair for us to judge people, especially from ancient history, whose recountings of their deeds we're seeing from people who probably weren't even alive from when they were. There's oral tradition skewing. 
We don't know. Like that is something that we do our best with ancient history. And there is a lot of great work to make sure we are as accurate as can be. But I mean, modern history already has propaganda and skewing going on. So Lord knows, you know, what has influenced how we view these people now, especially when there's so many concerted efforts from new rulers to make the last ruler look bad and make themselves look great and go on and destroy historical records of that person. Without question, I would say Grace of Kings is the most thought provoking book I've read so far this year in terms of what it's trying to say. I just wish at a couple different points there were not yeah, I guess monologues removed that were too clearly trying to tell the reader all of these things I just said that are happening in the book. Uh, there was one uh, monologue in particular between Mata and a love interest for them where it quite overtly says what I just said here in the review. And I was like, I get it. I'm sure everyone does now. And that's a personal preference taste. I know some people kind of like that. Okay, here's what I'm trying to say. It's just for me it was a little too much. And in a land that is so filled with hidden daggers and poisons and scheming, there are these moments of just like two good people meeting. And it might not be the most impactful uh, moment for the larger war, but there's these scenes where you, you get to see someone who was on the right side of history, but has now grown wiser and regrets some of their actions, meeting someone who is fundamentally in their life on a similar trajectory and, and they're able to exchange ideas. And while this person isn't able to totally change the other person, there's this like safety this comfort that's provided from seeing two good people meet and simply talk. It's a special book that can just have two characters meeting and exchanging and getting along and make you as the reader so excited, just as excited for that meeting as many other books uh, strive to get you for like an action sequence or a tremendous battle. I would say the book elevates from great to brilliant after the first major conflict is resolved and we begin setting up and transitioning into the second. Because unlike what so many books do, it really leans into the chaos of victory, right? Once you achieve a certain mission, the real challenge, as is said in so many different movies, begins. The problem is so many of those movies, books, what have you, don't actually really commit to that. Grace of Kings does. I would say there is a greater sense of danger in the latter half of the book than in the former. And once the corruption of power starts more heavily coming into play, and there are some like kind of blunt, okay moments to it, seeing our characters have to shift their skill set and succeed and fail at times into going from being conquerors to leaders. Oh, because, you know, Kunigaru, as I said, he is presented as this genius and he really is an intelligent leader, someone who is generous, someone who understands the individual, is willing to give anyone a shot, but that doesn't mean he's intelligent in every way. And so there are failings, too much trust, attempts at trying to smooth things over that, yeah, you understand where he's coming from because we're kind of in his head, not so much, but we, we know how he thinks. But it gets into that seemingly unavoidable trap for good people in court politics where you can go in with the best intentions, but if people view you as a threat, it doesn't matter how honest it you are. It doesn't matter how little power you are seeking. They're going to see an enemy in you. And you can't change someone who sees you as an enemy if that's how they're dedicated to seeing you from doing that, no matter what you say. Words can't solve every problem, which is a great tragedy of history. There is a ton of bloodshed that could have been avoided in this book if our main character made a better choice. But that doesn't ruin them. It doesn't make them just wallow in pity or try to reframe them as a villain. It's almost dispassionate. We have that view of like the ultimate God witness, just seeing what is important throughout history. And while sometimes, yes, it did feel like it was being shouted and early on the writing felt a little more unsure of its footing as it does later on, uh, Grace of Kings certainly overcomes those flaws. And overall, I would rank up among a must read for modern fantasy. I'm gonna give it a solid 8.5 out of 10. And uh, I think there's plenty of room for the sequels to climb even higher. And if I remember right, they do. Okay, so I'm at the point in editing where I literally just put in that harp 8.5 sound effect. And I was like, okay, I've gotten my rating down. Let's go check what other people are saying about this book. Because I try and avoid it until I get all my thoughts out. And I was shocked to see that Grace of Kings is below a 4.01 Goodreads, which, you know, 
hey, you know, everyone's allowed entitled to their opinion, but I wanted to see why, like, what are people's comments? And I found two things I really disagree with. Um, well, one, I actually can't comment on, so three. The third is that some people were commenting on how it pulls from Chinese history. As I said, I'm not very educated in that, unfortunately. Uh, I've actually learned the most about Chinese history through reading fantasy books based in China, which is obviously not a very uh, accurate or uh, informative way to go if you're looking to get like the real implications and everything. So I uh, can't speak to the third point. But the two that I can is one, people were talking about uh, female characters. And I can see how this isn't going to be regarded as like a, a feminist masterpiece, though I will push back and say that's kind of addressed that it, it's part of the setting, right? Because at these points in history, women were treated like shit. And I don't think Grace of Kings then takes away their agency. In fact, there's two female characters who kind of their arc is about seizing agency despite what the setting is doing around them. So I disagree there. And, you know, feel free to debate me in the comments. I just feel like these characters had a whole purpose, a whole momentum to them of going through extra layers of difficulty um, that our other main male characters are not because they're not only fighting in this wartime to stay alive, garner power, but also address the just abhorrent sexism against them. Um, and the second point was some people saying that it was just too long of a book. I cannot imagine a book covering this much ground so quickly and saying it needs to be shortened. I, I'm confused by that one. That one, I just, what? You want this to cover the same amount of ground faster? What? So let's go ahead and transition into spoiler talk because I want to talk about our two main <laughs> pro antagonists because wow, does uh, their Jade the Lion Dynasty have a lot to say here? So we're gonna go ahead and transition. I think I've given you plenty of time to click off the video in three, two, one. Friends to rivals. One of the best tropes, I think, uh, for motivating conflict in the genre. It takes a uh, bold writer, someone who is willing to eventually make ultimate sacrifices for characters they love to write. Uh, but Grace of Kings might be among the best to do it. And it's partially due to that huge scope we brought about because with Kunigaru and Mata, I really hope I'm saying that right. My dyslexic ass brain is so bad with these names. They complement each other so well in the first war when they work together, right? Having that strength led by that brain is perfect. And it almost felt like the first war was decided as soon as these two started working together. Cause it's like, there is no way this corrupt ass emperor is going to be able to overcome this level of genius and cooperation. And they have chemistry, maybe one of the most badass yet goofy moments that I was laughing at, but like fist pumping for is when Cody's like, you want to go up on the kite? And, and they just send him up for these duels and he's massacring motherfuckers that come up to duel him. Just incredible. And they learn from each other both ways. I mean, Kunigaru has a lot to learn about nobility and leadership. And Mata has a lot to learn about patience and understanding. And so you hope throughout this first war, they learn enough from each other, come to trust each other enough that, you know, in the aftermath, they'll be able to stay together. But there's this kind of, again, overly overt, in my opinion, observation that like friendships don't survive, uh, you know, after the war, right? I mean, and I was like, did you have to say it out loud? Like, I got where we were going, but okay. And that's a personal preference thing, right? I'm a jackass. And the actual conflict of, you know, Kunigaru kind of finishing the war without Mata and Mata getting offended by that, it, it, it felt a little bit like, come on, are we really gonna have this be the cause of all of this? But once uh, Grace of Kings doubles down and really starts to cause the schism here and we see how power corrupts Mata, uh, it became very believable. Uh, there's a little bit of turbulence while that transition happens, but honestly, such a dramatic shift in dynamic between two characters is almost always gonna have a little bit of turbulence. It's hard to pull off that kind of relationship pivot, but folding it in with these escalation of power and both of them, frankly, changing how they view themselves in the world, it becomes more believable. I think even more so if I remember uh, clearly on a reread. And I like the specific spices used 
to show how these men are changing. Kunugaru, uh, he is almost cheating on his wife. He is, you know, eventually that's kind of, they just agree to be polygamous. Is that the right term to you? It's like, politi I don't know idea. Sure. But inevitably, when people start treating you differently, you change. And so, yeah, Kunigaru's ego inflates and his ambition rises. He goes from someone who just wants to overthrow a corrupt government to someone who wants to implement a whole new ideology, right? He wants to totally change, you know, how the world is handled. And it's easy, right? If you're a simplistic reader, just be like, Kunigaru's on the right side of things. Great. But he is also just trying to conquer every, he's a conqueror, right? Like that, that inevitably, yes, we see as the story goes on, Kunigaro possibly right, right side of history, but it's too easy to just fall in line with him and assume everyone else is wrong, especially because at the same time, we're seeing Mata just, just lose his mind and just not able to handle the level of worship, power, paranoia, a very successful, you know, warping of his brain happening with an assassination earlier where he, you know, we see the effects of that on him. I really hope I'm keeping all this character straight here because my dyslexic brain with names that like, it doesn't register his names, ugh. Learning disabilities, ha! But I think what made this equation finally reach its solution and become the most dangerous feeling conflict of the whole book is as these two guys are rising to power, obviously they're looking out over the playing field and seeing who's my one rival. Well, if you're one of the duo that essentially won the war, who's the other big rival? <laughs> and you so desperately want to see these two start getting along again. You so desperately want this friendship to rekindle because you knew, because you know if they reunited, they would be able to make all kinds of incredible change. But what's preventing him from doing it is so human. Ego, perceived slights, insecurity, desire for more power, all of it makes sense. And while Kunigaru's kingdom is maybe painted a little too much as a utopia too fast, it fits into the just swaths of time and change that Grace of Kings kind of blurs together in the way it presents its narrative. So I'm able to forgive and be extremely lenient justifiably uh, with how much change happens in his corner of the world while he's relegated to it. And at the same same time, while Kunigaru is building this progressive haven, we see Mata just falling back into old ways, and while he's being manipulated, and while he's not mentally healthy, you still end up resenting him for his actions, right? The guy butchers, I think, 20,000 soldiers for no good reason, and you're just like, yeah, you were told to do it by someone who's sketchy, but you still did it. <laughs> uh, you bad, bad. Yes, sir, he is a very bad man indeed. And so for the final conflict, you're positioned fully behind the right character for the ending to be cathartic yet tragic. Uh, there is this release of victory, but I never felt good about it because of how much you know in your heart, these two could have been a great friendship for history, but instead the tragedy of Kunigaru having to put down what essentially became borderline a big jerk or something like that. The beat of the false treaty, I feel like could have been lifted out, but I get even why it was there. And uh, I think this is one of my new favorite court politic, toll war consuming uh, fantasy books of all time. Definitely ranked up high there. And uh, if you haven't read it and you're still here, absolutely do. It strikes the palette remarkably different. It's narrated by Michael Kramer, which yay. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Keep an eye out for my bookshelf roast dropping as soon as the sponsor approves the spot in it. And like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here and my fringe video is in its final round of copyright claim approvals so get ready for that as well have a good one y'all goodbye